Hello viewers, today we will discuss about processes of monopolization and marginalization. Relationship between resources and privileges. All the communities identified as underprivileged classes share a single characteristic. They lack a privilege, right, advantage or benefit which other communities possess. But in all cases, the privilege which is lacking and the reason for the deficiency are not the same. Privileges is based on the possession of or access to resource, physical, social or psychological resource. Those who possess the resource obtain a power or advantage from it which expresses as a benefit or privilege to that community. Those who do not possess or have access to the resource or are unable to utilize it lack the power and the privilege. There is a commonly held notion that all the underprivileged classes have been the victims of conscious oppression and exploitation by more powerful and prosperous communities. But this is an enormous and overly simplified view. Possession or access to a privilege may be the result of natural conditions such as geography or material resources. Those living in favorable habitats such as the fertile valley gain an adaptive advantage and develop faster and further than those living in less hospitable environments. Privilege also derives from social factors such as education. As educated population is able to respond more effectively to new life opportunities and new technologies. In addition to physical and social conditions, privilege is determined by cultural and psychological factors as well. For example, a community in which traits of individual initiative and risk taking are dominant can avail of enormous opportunities open to the enterprising pioneer, whereas communities in which authority and social harmony are dominant values may be slower or innovate. Our discussion focuses on two main issues. First, what are the marginalizing processes and how do they operate? Second, why are so many people of the same groups, women, ethnic groups, religious minorities marginalized in a variety of situations and institutions. Major approaches to marginalization are represented by neoclassical economics, social exclusion theory and recent research that develops social exclusion theory findings. Marxists see marginalization as a structural phenomena endemic to capitalism. For Marx, the reserve army of the proletariat a pool of unemployed or partially unemployed laborers is used by employers to lower wages. The most impoverished elements from the reserve army, from the bases in Marxist time, often called as conglomeration of beggars, discharged soldiers and vagabonds. Marx also noted the presence of ethnic minorities such as the Irish in the reserve army. Although Strongly influenced by Marxism, contemporary social exclusion theory stresses the importance of social networks and symbolic boundaries. Studying the economic recovery of the late 1970s, French sociologists noted that some groups, particularly migrants and youth, benefited relatively little from renewed growth. They concluded that sustained unemployment leads to poverty which in turn leads to social isolation, including the breakup of families and the financial inability to fully participate in the popular culture. Current research has led to modifications of social exclusion theory. States and kin networks can play a significant role in moderating the effects of prolonged unemployment. Generous Dutch and Danish welfare states keep the unemployed out of poverty. In Italy, the tendency of all unmarried adult children, including unemployed adult children, 
to remain in households with members who have ties to labor markets moderates social isolation. Less generous welfare states and the relatively early departure of adult children from households leaves the unemployed especially susceptible to social isolation. Everywhere, immigrant workers who do not receive the full benefits of the welfare state and whose families are often not integrated into job markets remain marginalized. Recent work by American sociologist Charles Tilly further stresses the importance of economic structures and social networks to marginalization. For Tilly, capitalist control of jobs combined with included groups monopolization of job, Nietzsche's help explains why adult native white men are privileged in many different hierarchies. Whereas non-adult, migrant, non-white women are invariably among the excluded. He emphasizes that new job hierarchies within capitalist industry tend to be filled according to already existing social distinctions. Employers used old distinctions to justify and buttress new workplace distinctions and maintain harmony by endorsing distinctions that already divide the labor force. In doing so, employers and included groups perpetuate the existing social distinctions and reinforce them, creating durable inequality. Increasingly, modern interpretations stress marginalization, collective character and the role of state, elites and entrenched groups in determining who is marginalized. But wherever it occurs, marginalization seldom begins afresh. Institutions typically fill new job hierarchies in line with existing social ranks. Groups marginalized in the past have the best chance of being marginalized in the future. Privileges derived from physical resources. The relationship between privileges and underprivileged communities can be examined in detail with a reference to physical, social and psychological resources. Firstly, geography. The most basic of all physical resources is natural geography. Some nations are blessed by protective features like mountains, deserts, rivers and oceans which provide a natural fortification for defense. Favorable geography can provide a military advantage over other people and communal security against attack. This power and security are forms of social privilege which bestow an adaptive advantage on the community which possesses them. Violent storms at sea destroyed two huge Mongolian fleets attempting invasion of Japan during the 13th century. And for the following 600 years, Japan's geographical isolation assured its freedom from any foreign threat until the arrival of the American fleet in 1854. This tranquil security enabled the Japanese to evolve a harmonious society and closely knit national identity which were the basis for its rapid rise as a world power during the last century. England benefited by its geographic isolation from turmoils on the continent thereby enabling it to evolve into the first modern nation state. Conversely, there are many people exposed to the constant threat of war because of indefensible natural boundaries. Ancient Palestine was at the crossroads of early civilization and was subjected to wave after wave of invasion and subjection which continues up to the present day. In other cases, the disturbing factor may be climatic, such as periodic cyclones, floods or droughts. The absence of a stable and secure environment can deprive people of the necessary basis for political, economic and social development, thereby creating a deprived underprivileged class. Other geographic resources play a similar role. Natural infrastructure like a port, a river, proximity to a trade route, can generate enormous economic benefits. In earlier centuries, tiny nations like Holland and Belgium 
carried on a vast overseas trade and possessed large colonial empires that their far bigger neighbor, Germany, whose access to the sea was more limited. Inland and landlocked countries in Eastern Europe, which were deprived of the advantages of the overseas trade, military mobility by sea, developed less than those bordering the Atlantic and Mediterranean. Geographic advantage has been employed to monopolies, other privileges. For centuries, Western European powers monopolized the seas and the trade routes. It has also been used to oppress and exploit other people as in the forced transport of African tribals to the American colonies. Secondly, land. Historically, possession of the rich fertile land has been one of the major determinants of development. A large landmass permits unimpeded population growth and expansion of civilization. High per capita land holdings provide a basis for higher individual productivity and standard of living. The absence of good land results in economic backwardness, harsh living conditions and emigration. For example, desert nomad tribes like the Kalharis, insufficient landmass leads to crowding and congestion as in urban slums. Sri Lanka and Burmese's repatriates of Tamil origin returning to India during the last decade constitute a landless underprivileged class which lacks the productive base for development. Economic privilege is only one of the benefits of good land. Economic strength supports political and military power and the development of culture. The early centers of civilization were all located in fertile river valleys like the Nile, the Ganga, the Kaveri. The absence of these one resource results in the deprived underprivileged classes suffering from political, social and cultural as well as economic backwardness. Monopolization of land resources or revenues by one community leads to the concentration of wealth and political power in the hands of the landed aristocracy or zamindari class and forces those who are deprived to remain as landless laborers or simply tenant farmers. Political refugees such as the Armenians, Palestinians, Bengalis, Afghans and Cambodians form another category of landless underprivileged classes. Land resources are more fully exploited by employing other groups to cultivate them in return for a bare sustenance. The resulting exploited underprivileged class is composed of serfs, slaves and bonded labor. Other natural resources. In addition to land, other natural resources like water, forests, minerals and petroleum generate power and privileges. And scarcity of any of them can form the basis for the underprivileged classes. In the past, caste Hindus denied Harijans access to water from the community wells and tanks. Powerful large landholders monopolized water from any irrigation channel. White colonists in Africa monopolized the mineral wealth and exploited cheap black labor for mining. Tribal forest communities were expelled from their homelands by government or watched helplessly as the forests were cut down to feed paper mills or pave the way for new roads and settlements. Physical and social infrastructure. Physical and social infrastructure, facilities like roads, railways, power stations, schools, hospitals, markets, banks and recreation areas constitute another group of resources which confer a privilege on those who have ready access to them and deny an advantage to those who do not. Unlike the resources mentioned above, the location and distribution of these facilities is primarily determined by conscious choice, often by government and frequently with the insufficient awareness of the impact of decisions on various social groups. Military factors and the primary aim of facilitating transport of raw materials for export 
were influential in determining the routes for major roads and railway lines in the British colonies. Those communities fortunate enough to fall on or near the routes enjoyed a great stimulus for development provided by the opening of distinct markets and access to new information, new products and new ways of life. The presence of one infrastructure facility attracts others to the same site and bestow compound privileges on the local community. For instance, the location of schools, hospitals, factories, markets and banks are all influenced by the location of roads. The absence of one infrastructure facility tends to generate a syndrome since it discourages the establishment of others, retards development and therefore preserves backwardness. Rural areas are particularly susceptible due to low population density, lack of political organization, low income and wealth, marginalization of young women. Marginalization appears to be potentiated by many variables. Its roots are often deeply embedded within the society and many times the oppression is felt but not acknowledged as such by those who are marginalized. When considering the process of marginalization, it is important to be cognizant that the process is both ambiguous and complex. During adolescence, Girls work to create a self-identity, a sense of hope and their potential places in society. Adolescence is informed by the wealth of their individual childhood experiences. These foundational experiences shape many of the responses, thoughts and actions of each girl. When marginalization informs adolescent development, girls often do not feel valued, included listened to or intelligent during the junior high or middle school experience. Some girls discover alternate paths to self-empowerment. Other girls may not fare so well. Educational ambition and performance often decline by the time girls enter high school if they have not established a sense of hope, self-efficacy and empowerment. This may impede their ability to attain high social status as adults. However, girls should not be viewed as victims of marginalization. A victim role assumes the girls have no recourse in the situation and implies these girls must be rescued when in fact girls are quite capable of rescuing themselves if provided a little support. Girls first need to become cognizant of the ways in which they are marginalized and then they must choose to eradicate the marginalizing variables. They can only become empowered through consciousness of marginalizing factors coupled with personal actions and decisions. Socialization of girls. Three fields of influence tend to inform the ways girls are socialized in society. They include attitudes appearing to originate in the society in which she lives factors embedded in the culture of the educational system and self-limiting views or temperaments. Parental and societal actions and ideologies affect a young person's self-image and conceptualization of his or her ability to succeed. Girls often look at their mothers or other women in the community as mentors. These women have the power to instill either a sense of hope and self-efficacy or despair in girls' perceptions of their abilities and societal values. Parents' gendered communications with their adolescent children tend not to reinforce body consciousness and the importance of niceness and pleasantness in girls, but also to encourage egalitarian gender roles and to a lesser degree toughness. Boys, on the other hand, are reminded less often to egalitarian gender roles, but more often of body consciousness, toughness, and interestingly, niceness and pleasantness. Privileges derived from social resources. The distribution of social resources plays an equally important role in generating privileges for the underprivileged classes. Firstly, population. 
Another basic social resource is population size. A society with a large population obtains a military and economic advantage by virtue of sheer number and generating greater political or economic power for the group, though not necessarily for each of its members. Large nations can achieve what smaller ones cannot. Larger ethnic, linguistic, religious and social groups can obtain greater privileges and impose their priorities, customs and beliefs on the larger body politic. Small groups with insufficient numbers may become politically, economically and socially deprived minorities without a voice. Frequently, the dominant group reserves all privileges for itself and denies a minority access to resources as the caste Hindus excluded the Harijans and tribes. In some cases, minorities are actively exploited for the benefit of larger groups as the American Indians were by European settlers. Secondly, organization. The capacity of a community to organize for military, political or economic purposes is an invaluable social resource which tends to evolve around with other aspects of social development. Education. In the present age, the single most important resource is education. It generates greater power and privileges to those that possess it than capital. Education is the main lever for political, social and economic development. Historically, certain nations, religious groups, classes and communities have developed this resource more than others and profited by adaptive and innovative capacities it fosters. Conclusion, energy, dynamism and enterprise are essential for development. Many underprivileged classes are deficient in these psychological resources. In some cases, these traits have been actively denied expression in an entire population. The European colonists of Asia and Africa employed fear, authoritarianism and repression to control the local population, thereby stifling human initiative. In those nations which have recently emerged from under the yoke of imperialism, the generations born after independence in an atmosphere of political and social freedom exhibit far greater energy and initiative than their forefathers. Smaller groups of underprivileged classes which have been excluded or exploited like the Harijans in India and blacks in USA are only gradually acquiring this invaluable resource which they were long denied. I sincerely hope this lecture proves to be informative and enlightening for all the viewers. Thank you.